The History with Jackson podcast. Hello and welcome back to the History with Jackson podcast. Now today on the podcast, I'm speaking to Sunday Times number one best-selling author, Damien Lewis, all about his brand new book, SAS, Forged in Hell, From Desert Rats to Dogs of War, The Mavericks Who Made the SAS. Now this was an awesome episode. Damien touched on the SAS invasion of Sicily, the Allied invasion of mainland Italy and the different experiences that the SAS troops went through under their leader during this period, Blair Paddy Maine. You're going to love this episode and Damien is a fantastic storyteller. And if you do enjoy listening to this episode, please head to History of Jackson Plus on Apple Podcasts or the Buy Me A Coffee profile in the description below to support History of Jackson and continue creating the content that we create Now, without further ado, I will leave you in the knowledgeable hands of Damien. Hello and welcome back to the History of Jackson podcast. Today, we're talking to author and historian Damien Lewis about his brand new book. And I really, really loved reading this. And I know you guys guys are going to enjoy listening to Damien talk about it. SAS, Forged in Hell, From Desert Rats to Dogs of War, The Mavericks Who Made the SAS. How are you doing, Damien? I'm good. Good to be on. No, thank you very much for coming on. I really appreciate you giving your time to come on to the podcast and discuss the book with us. Yeah, no problem. Good to be here. Well, the first question I want to ask you, and it's the question I ask all the guests that come on the podcast, what inspired you to to write this book? So this book begins 10 years ago in terms of the origin story when I got an email dropped into my inbox via my website from a bunch of people calling themselves The Keepers. And trying to cut a long story short, they explained that they were the keepers or are the keepers of the the flame, the memory of um, Colonel Blair Paddy Main, who arguably is the most highly decorated British soldier of the Second World War. I mean, DSO, Distinguished Service Order, three bars, and then Légion d'Honneur, Croix de Guerre, and various other high valor medals. And basically what they they were reaching out to me because in the main family home in Mount Pleasant in Northern Ireland, they kind of rediscovered his war chest, um, which is this huge, huge uh, wooden trunk, which was stuffed full of the records and memorabilia of five years of waging war behind enemy lines, and also lots and lots of other memorabilia. And it was, stu- it was actually in the, in the attic stuffed behind a, a water system, believe it or not. And so they asked, would you um, be interested in coming in and looking at this material and seeing if there might be a book in it? And um, that is an opportunity that rarely comes a an author or historian's way because, you know, this is uh, unique material, most of which had never seen the light of day. So I jumped on a plane, flew to Northern Ireland, went to the home of Fiona Main, sorry, Fiona Ferguson, Nay Main. So that's Paddy Main's niece. Um, and her, his nearest living relative, and there, you know, laid out in the living room was this treasure trove of history. Um, and it's one of those moments where you walk through the door and think, "Golly, am I up? To, am I up to this? You know, is one worthy?" Um, they hoped that one book might, you know, come out of it. I sat down to study it and started writing, and the first book simply covered the first eighteen months because there was so much there. So this is the second book in what will be a three-book series, I would imagine. Although I'm trying to kind of finding my way through it. Um, I have a fantastic publisher who just says, go away and write what you want to write. We know it's going to be good. Just do it. So this book uh, is the second. The first book was SAS Brothers in Arms, the first 18 months of the SAS birth story in, in, in the North African desert. This is the the next stage. It's the push into in, into Nazi and fascist uh, Europe, you know, bludgeoning open those steel shores, uh, at, 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 you know, in which the SAS served at the very tip of the spear. It's a it's a great story about how you came across the the source material for this because you know like like you said it's such an amazing opportunity for any historian to to come across a a source basis such as that and the way that you've been able to get Paddy Paddy's life across in this book and your others is is amazing. Now we we've, we've discussed him very slightly and I kind of want to, to touch on you know, Colonel Blair, Paddy Main, because he is a fascinating character. Could you let us know in more detail who Paddy is and, and who the SAS are? Because, you know, we talk about the SAS quite a lot in everyday life and 
but some people might not have heard of Maine and some people might have this mythologized view of the SAS. Yeah, so the SAS were formed in um in in, in the summer of 1941. Um I mean actually the, the the name SAS came from before that, but that's kind of by the by. I mean David Sterling when the 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 guards officer, very well connected guards officer who who founded the SAS was gifted the name Special Air Service because there was a, a unit before that called 11 Special Service Brigade, Special Air Service Brigade, sorry, who were the original parachutists, but that's kind of by the by. And they were formed to wage war. I mean, Stunning's idea was to wage war in a way that certainly the British Army, and I don't think any army had ever done before. So the, the opportunity was North Africa, the desert, you know, wide open spaces, uninhabitable, so supposedly unnavigable, supposedly unmapped, certainly. And therefore, neither army was fighting in the desert. They were fighting along the coastal plain. And Sterling, it just occurred to Sterling that, you know, if you could actually beat the desert or actually learn to live with it, um, find your way through it, you could then strike deep behind enemy lines. And if you could get back again, it would be an amazing way of not just destroying the enemy's um, key assets. And at this time, we're talking war planes, especially. It would be a way of spreading chaos and terror um, amongst all ranks of the enemy where they least expected it. And for, for any military, that's a very disconcerting thing. If you could never feel safe, no matter where you are, it's a huge blow to your morale. So that was Sterling's idea. And that involved finding a means to get through the desert, navigate one's way, a means of attack and all the things that followed with it. But it also involved, more importantly, waging war in a way that had never been done before. Because you can't order, you know, 12 men, most patrols weren't a great deal larger than that, um, to spend, you know, months in the desert facing suicide missions where if you don't get killed by the enemy or captured, you're probably going to die of thirst or get lost. You just can't order, you know, soldiers to do that because if, if you're purely ordering them on the basis of your rank, they're just as likely to wait till they get behind the nearest hidden sand dune and put a bullet in your head because why wouldn't they? Um, The only way, you can lead those kind of missions and get your men to follow you is by what's called transformational command. It's, that's a modern day concept. There was no concept of it at the time, which is that you lead by camaraderie and esprit de corps and brotherhood and actually by by filial love, you know, the, the love, love of your brother warrior. And if you talk to any of those men who were commanded by Sterling, but especially Maine, they talk of this reverence, this absolute reverence uh, and, and this incredible towering respect for a man. I'll give you an example. I interviewed Alec Borry, who was who sadly now passed away, but I interviewed him in in February of this year. He was one of the last two surviving members of of the uh, of one SAS, uh, the wartime SAS, and he said to Paddy Main, whose memory was still so fresh in his mind, he said, "You know, you would follow him into hell because of any individual. You had the faith that if anyone could bring you out of hell, he would." He could bring you back again alive. And not only that, he would never ask you to do anything he wouldn't be willing to do himself and he would lead from the front always. So that's the concept. That was the spirit that the SAS espoused from very word go. And it was also the spirit that any individual in the unit, no matter their rank, was capable of going ahead and prosecuting the mission to the end. So if only the trooper or the corporal were left alive and all the rest were killed or captured, you could still go ahead plant your bombs on the enemy airfield and try to get back alive. So that independence and self-starting spirit, that concept of merit above rank, the piratical nature of their operations, the fact you could carry pretty much any weapon you wanted, your clothing was largely up to you as long as it was various items of uniform. It was designed to you know, be comfortable, keep you warm in the desert at night when it's very cold. All of that freedom and leeway you were given was not the way the British military waged war, certainly not at that time. So it was revolutionary and deeply unpopular with high command. That's what the SAS espoused from its earliest roots. And then Paddy Main was one of David Sterling, the founders, you know, key first recruits, one of the original. And Main, before the war, already had this iconic status because he was a born and brought up in Northern Ireland, but he was not only the Irish university's heavyweight boxing champion, so, you know, a serious uh, martial artist um, of repute, but he was also a, a, a acclaimed rugby player who had been capped not just numerous times for the Irish side, because people from Northern Ireland can play in the Irish side and vice versa, 
Um, but he had been capped for the British and Irish Lions. And when playing for the British and Irish Lions in South Africa, even the South African press had praised him as being an outstanding forward. So this was a man who already came to the SAS with this incredible reputation. And very quickly, he proved himself to be the raider par excellence, the raider par excellence and the leader of men par excellence, certainly at the cold face of operations, less um, comfortable, you could argue, fighting the battles on high with high command to keep the SS alive and keep the detractors off their back and, you know, and, and the fight for equipment and recruits and all that kind of thing. That was less Paddy Men's milieu, but out front, deep behind enemy lines, uh, leading, you know, brutal, merciless, merciless sabotage operations against enemy airfields in the desert. That's where he really came alive. And his men appreciated that. And as I said, they believed that if anyone could bring them back alive, he could. But at the same time, bear in mind, incredibly well read. He was a trained solicitor. He, he qualified in norm, was working as a solicitor prior to the war. And if you look at the people who kind of naturally graduated to and became his friends in the war, they were People like Bob Mello, a Belgian who was one of the oldest recruits in the SAS, who was in his 40s already, had fought in the First World War with the Belgium Air Force, won a high valor medal, got decorated, uh, then got injured, was his invalid is out. No one would accept him in the military but in the Second World War because of his age and his injuries until the British Intelligence Service recruited him. And then from there, he became a member of the SAS. Well, Bob Mello was not just a polyglot, spoke many languages. He'd, he he lived in, in North Africa. He'd settled there, become a merchant there, incredibly well-read, incredibly well-cultured. He and Paddy Main became inseparable. Or Malcolm Playdell, the SAS's doctor, the first doctor ever recruited into the unit. Again, Playdell, incredibly well-read, incredibly cultured, a, re a real man of letters, as was Paddy Main. Um, Playdell's writings about those earliest days of the SAS are brilliant, so evocative. He and Paddy Main became inseparable, and on paper they were so unsuited to each other as kind of friends because Playdell kind of ended up in the SS by accident and, and and initially thought what am I doing here I mean I'm a doctor here I am you know with these you know cutthroats raiding you know German bases out of the desert by surprise and causing mayhem destruction and and by the end of it he was the most diehard adherent of their operations there ever was to the extent that when he actually had to leave the SAS kind of in the spring of 43. Playdell left because he was traumatised, because he had failed to save, you know, many of the men who got injured. And, and when he left, he basically said, I will never know an experience that will ever come close to this again. And that was really his, his, his position on it for the rest of his life. So those were the kind of people who, who graduated to Maine, but, but so too did, did all others under his command, including, you know, the, you know, somebody like Alec Borry, who'd been working in a factory prior to the war, or those indeed who'd been in the brig, you know, been in a military prison and were recruited into the SAS. So it was a very broad church. And 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 certainly in the early days, in, in, in World War Two, Paddy Main became this iconic leader very quickly. You know, the way you describe him in the book, he comes across as such an inspirational individual. And you, you get those people saying that they'd follow him into hell. You know, it certainly comes across in the way that he treated his men, spoke with his men, and, and led his missions. And one of the main the main mission that we speak about in this in this book is the Allies are wanting to take Sicily. So, where did the idea for this this come about, and and how did the battle for the island begin? So, in in February forty three, David Sterling, the founder of the SAS, gets captured in North Africa, and yet another attempt is made to disband these raiders of the thug variety as they were classed by middle east headquarters that's actually how the senior commanders described them despite the fact that they had destroyed 387 proven enemy aircraft on the ground in north africa uh, probably you know probably well in excess of 400 more than the raf but they were still branded as raiders of the thug variety in fact the more successful they became the less popular they became because they proved by their very success that their detractors were wrong and their way, way of waging war was right it was that catch-22 you're damned by your own success so when sterling's captured you know the attitude is well you were you know your way of waging war was all well and good for the north african desert where you can get away with being pirates and and wearing your hodgepodge of uniforms but you know we're moving into europe now and that's going to be a gentlemanly warfare and there's no room for your kind of fighting there so maine had to fight this desperate rear guard action to once again save his unit from being disbanded and extinction 
And the way he, he kind of set upon to do so was to prove yet again that they had a raison d'etre and a purpose. And to do that, he, he accepted what is not arguably, definitely the most suicidal, um, insane, uh, impossible mission of any unit that was uh, tasked to be involved in the Operation Husky landings, which were the Allied landings on Sicily, you know, the thrust into the soft underbelly of Europe, the first Allied attempt to crowbar open fascist and Nazi shores, you know, hugely defended. So massive invasion fleet setting sail for southern Italy. The biggest danger uh, as they approach the shores are these these these, these massive concrete um, uh, engirdled shore guns which overlook the, the, the seas south of Italy. If those guns open fire on the Allied invasion fleet, then they can be blasted out of the water and it, 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 it may well be a disaster. Paddy Main and 280-odd SAS, that's his unit that he's recruited and trained, take on the job of getting off their converted uh, passenger ferry, the Ulster Monarch, which had been converted into a landing, a landing craft carrying ship, get into their landing craft, these small assault landing crafts, sail into the Sicily shoreline beneath these very guns, it has to be said, at night, scale these vertical cliffs laden down with impossible loads, including mortars and mortar shells, and then assault these gun batteries, knowing they are outnumbered 50 to 1. That's their mission. And it's actually the mission at which the the book, uh, The Guns of Navarone, and then the movie, is based upon. Obviously, The Guns of Navarone is fictionalised, but it's based upon this operation. That area that they had to attack was called, uh, well, the English translation is the Pig's, Pig's Snout Peninsula. And, um, you know, at the same time as they were going in, there were hundreds of airborne paratroopers supposed to land mainly by gliders actually and take the key other objectives so bridges leading inland so that once the allied invasion force got ensure that they would then be able to advance swiftly to take the main port which was crucial for getting all the supplies landed ashore that, that an invasion force would need and that night that they sail into um to Sicily's shores I mean, bear in mind, it's July, you know, 1943. Everyone expects it to be a dead calm. A horrendous storm blows up. So unbeknown to Maine and his men, as they get into... Yeah, so there's a moment, is it a go, is it a no-go? Because the storm's so bad. Maine, rightly, can't countenance not going in. Because if they don't go in, then, you know, you can imagine the worst that can happen. So it's a go. It has to be a go, whatever the cost. So, And as they get into their landing craft, unbeknown to them, those airborne troops, a very large proportion of them, because the gliders have been released, it's blowing a hoolie, there's zero visibility, all the gliders are blown off course, most of them. So there are, there are scores of these wooden gliders have landed in the sea, and these, these, these poor benighted paratroopers are clinging onto them, and many are drowning. It's utterly horrendous those that have actually landed ashore because the airborne planners it sounds unbelievable they hadn't even done their job properly they hadn't even got proper reconnaissance photographs so they didn't understand that the terrain ashore was not just uh bare and boulder strewn but crisscrossed with these dry stone walls so any glider trying to land was just going to plow into obstructions and get and get you know mashed up to matchwood which is what's happened to to, to those that have actually got ashore. So as Maine and his men are going in on their landing craft through these storm-swept seas at night under cover of darkness, hoping the gun the gunners don't sit, see them, what the first thing they find is they start obviously stumbling across these half-submerged gliders with these paratroopers who are desperate to be rescued. And they they rescue a few, but the, two things. First of all, they can't delay. And you can, you can understand why they can't delay, because if they delay, the, the, you know, the, the whole raison d'etre of their mission is put in jeopardy. And the second reason they can't do very much is because you just don't have the room on the landing craft. These these ALCs are small. And so they have to leave most of them to their fate. That is the start of the operation. And it is utterly, utterly horrendous. And then when they actually get into the, to, 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 you know, to, to the target shores by kind of, by a unimaginable irony, the first gun emplacement that they assault 
the Italian commander, when he realises he's actually got a ground assault happening, not he's not being bombed, attacked from the air because he's getting because Maine's men have carried mortars, mortar tubes, and mortars up the cliff faces, and the first thing they do is they start mortaring the the the, the, the nearest target. And when the Italian commander realises this is not an air attack, but it's actually men on the ground, he calls the nearest German garrison command for backup, and the German commander refuses to believe that Allied raiders could have made it ashore on a night such as this. And so the Germans don't send in reinforcement, and that allows Maine and his men to fight their way in, way in and seize that first gun battery and then and then use their demolition charges to blow it to smithereens. So, you know, this is um this is this is this is achieving a mission that that on paper should have been impossible even before that storm blows up. And and the fact that that he and his men pull it off. And then they go on to seize three other gun emplacements, by the way. So they seize the first, and then they move quickly across the Pig's Heads Peninsula, fighting their way across it in these series of battles, and they seize all three of the, the gun emplacements that exist there and put them all out of action. It's an it's an utterly extraordinary um, string of successes, to the extent that General Dempsey, who was at that stage the commander of the kind of elite forces going in on operations, and he's a, he's a First World War veteran, so he's commanded men for decades he says to paddy main you know shortly after the operation it was a brilliant operation brilliantly carried out and then he goes on to say that he has never had men under his command whose esprit de corps and spirit and discipline would come any anywhere close to, to paddy main's sas it's it's a remarkable achievement to to have captured all those those uh those places and in the way that they did as well like you just said you know it was a mission that no one else thought was possible, but they still need to go through and and take the rest of Sicily. Uh, Sicily. So how important, how successful was the drive to take Augusta Town, and and how pivotal was was Maine in that? Yeah. So I mean, after they'd taken the gun emplacements, you know, you, <laughs> you, you would have imagined they might have earned you know a few hours downtime. So they get back onto the Ulster Monarch, this converted you know passenger ferry. Um, and, and and just to give you a bit of background, because it's it's a fabulous story. The main has had his um his engineer, his chief engineer, a, a chap called Bill Deakins, Sergeant Bill Deakins, carve a wooden wing dagger shield, and they've mounted it on the front, on the prow of the Ulster Monarch. So this is a Royal Naval ship bearing the winged. It's actually not a winged dagger. It's it's actually the sword of Damocles. But sorry, the King Arthur's you know sword. But it doesn't matter. They've got the winged dagger. Let's call it you know, emblem on the front of the warship with the motto, who dares wins. You know, it, it, it's it's uh, the SAS and the crew of the Ulster Monarch and the captain in particular. Somehow it's like this marriage made in heaven. Anyway, they get back on the board, the Ulster Monarch, and they're desperate for a shower and a, and, and a feed. And pretty much immediately, they are warmed off for another mission. And basically what's happened is someone has allegedly seen a white flag of surrender flying over Augusta, which is one of the next major ports north up the coast of Sicily. And it just happens to be a major, major German and Italian naval base. So there are, there's a submarine fleet there. There's a seaplane fleet there. There are e-boats there stationed there. That there is a major surface craft base there. This is a serious, serious um, German and Italian naval port. And, and it's very, 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 very heavily defended with shore guns, as you would imagine of such a facility. But someone says, claims to have seen a white flag of surrender flying. So Maine and his men are told they're going to go in and take the surrender of this huge enemy port. Okay, now they're somewhat suspicious because during their battle to take the Pig's Heads Peninsula, there have been several incidents where the Italians have so supposedly surrendered, you know, thrown down their weapons, put their hands in the air. And when the SAS have come up to them, they've dropped to the ground and someone behind them's opened up with a machine gun. In fact, the only casual, real casualties of that first operation are, are, are caused by such deception operations or, or, or treachery, however you want to call it. So Maine and his men are extremely uh, suspicious and sceptical. However, th they've got orders, and their orders are to go in to Augusta on the Ulster Monarch and land and, and take the port in daylight. So off they set. They steam to, to in, you know, in, in, into Augusta. And... The captain, and this is where he earns this brilliant nickname, Captain Crash. Basically, as, as they turn into the port, the escorting cruiser sends a message saying, you know, where, because the, the captain's clearly steaming for shore, 
and and the captain of the um, the cruiser says, you know, where where on earth do you think you're going? He says, I'm going to land my troops, and um, it, it was not quite what the orders were, and 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 <laughs> basically the. The commander of the Royal Naval warship says, then you're going to need all the support, all the gunfire support we can manage. And so very quickly, it becomes clear that no one has no one has surrendered in Augusta because the Royal Navy ships come under fire. Captain Crash is speeding the Ulster Monarch as fast as it will steam towards the shore. And they stop and they drop the landing craft. And so this is where Paddy, Paddy Main absolutely demonstrates why he was so revered by his men. So in the lead landing craft, the lead figure, is Major Paddy Main, the commander of that unit. He is the first person to jump out the ramp and storm the beaches under intense machine gun fire. He leads from the front. And when he gets to the shore wall, the shelter of the shore wall, some of his men obviously behind him cut down. He's the first person over the wall to lead them into the town to to take the the port town of, of Augusta. So that's just a powerful demonstration of how you know, this one individual, he had no, there was no need for him to do, well, okay, in in in, in, in traditional military kind of thinking, I guess, there were, you know, your commander, um, someone of that rank doesn't lead from the front in such a situation for obvious reasons. But as far as main concern, that is the only way you can lead this kind of unit. And of course, he, he takes his force into the town and there is a, a battle that lasts all that night in which they are taking on, you know, a, a, a German and Italian armour. They've got tanks in town and everything else. The, the most potent piece of weaponry, weaponry they have, other than um, their Bren guns, is a Piat. These these kind of spring-loaded bazookas, which are a bit like a pea shooter. So, you know, the odds are horrendous, and yet they pull through. And, and by dawn, Allied forces arrive. They've held the port, and the port, you know, is theirs. And they capture, you know, U-boats and... and 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 all the seaplanes and and everything else that that that's that's there in that port. But then I guess the tension and stress of the last few days comes to the fore, and you know they're in this they're in this Italian port town. Uh, there's no sign yet of them being being pulled out, and there's a lot of wine been left behind in the houses. And so the men decide it's time to, they haven't eaten for a very long time because they've got no food on the Ulster Monarch. So they start brewing up on the pavement and they break, break, break open the wine and they start to have a street party. And then someone finds a pianola. So self-playing piano that comes out in the street and the party atmosphere stiffens. And then someone else discovers the, what was the brothel, for the German Italian troops, because German Italian troops tended to have brothels that went with them as part of the service. Um, and some of the guys get into the brothel and they get the makeup and the lingerie that the ladies were wearing and they dress up in that. And there's this crazy, wild street party that takes place. Meanwhile, Maine has ordered Bill Deakins, his demolitions expert, into the, into the main bank in Augusta and they blow the safe up. To, to find out what's to discover what's in the safe and you know there, there's loads of documents in there maybe that's that's good intelligence there's booty in there whatever it might be um and you know typical of maine when the military police actually turn up and and the captain is um the captain of the military police is somewhat nonplussed but mildly at what he's witnessing and he goes to find the commanding officer of this scurrilous outfit and he he he, he discovers maine in his office <laughs> Maine doesn't quite throw him out through the window, but it's it's it, it, it's pretty damn close. So you know he um, he recognised that when men fought as hard as they had fought over you know any number of days, facing impossible odds twice now in a row, and Augusta's worse than the Pig's Head Peninsula, by the way. That that is a far less um, uh, doable and achievable mission. It's it's just absolutely suicidal. And he recognised that when men face those kind of odds and those kind of situations, that fear and that knowledge almost that you're facing certain death, you know, time after time, they also then deserve to party. And when they party, they deserve to let their hair down. So he's got that innate understanding of how to lead men in battle, but also how to allow them to um, let their hair down when they need to. Uh, you know, right, reading about that battle was was so interesting here about the different dynamics but i think my favorite part as you just touched on was what happened between maine and that military police officer where he comes in and and he, he shows that relationship and his disdain for them but you know very quickly the allies decide that they need to go for the italian mainland 
why did they feel the need to attack the mainland after taking Sicily? And, and why were the SAS enlisted for this attack? I mean, the whole concept of the soft underbelly of Europe, that's a phrase Churchill, you know, um, coined. Churchill had always argued North Africa, then Italy. And he'd always argued that to Roosevelt. Um, and in fact, Roosevelt's, you know, top military commands were dead set against it. They wanted to go from Britain into France. You know, that Italy was never on the cards for them. The reason they argued for that was because obviously crossing, you know, across the channel, it's just a few, you know, dozens of kilometers and you're, you've already got a, you know, well-established friendly nation upon which to build up your forces, Great Britain. Um, but Churchill always believed that the soft underbelly of Italy was the way, and he managed to carry Roosevelt with him. And part of the compelling reason why they had to make this series of landings bite hard was because of Stalin and the Russians. Because, of course, you know, Nazi Germany had um, first cut their deal with Russia, their, you know, egregious deal, not non-aggression pact, whatever you want to call it. Um, and then, of course, turned against the, the Russians because that was always their intention to push eastwards. Um, and 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 so you know Stalin was fighting that war, uh, and it was costing the Russians absolutely dear in terms of men and material and territory. And he was demanding that the Allies, Britain and America, open a second front. And and Italy was seen to be the way to do it reasonably quickly, using North Africa as a springboard to do so. So they had to bite, and they had to bite hard and advance quickly. And so very quickly after uh, Sicily was was you know taken, and it was taken far quicker than the Allies at first imagined it would be, they had to move on to mainland Italy. And with the British landings in the very south of Italy, there was a um, a kind of choke point slightly further up the, up the coast at a place called Bagnara. And so, again, the SAS were used as this force to land um, you know, in, the, in the teeth of the enemy and to take a strategic point which would enable the main body of the British force to move through and advance quickly up the up the western coastline of, of the of the Italian mainland. It's exactly what they did, the Bagnara landings. Again, it was, you know, it was horrendous terrain to land into. They basically had to land on a beach into a town with the enemy commanding all the heights. And it was pretty much day but daylight by the time the landing craft actually got them there. Uh, in some ways it was almost a repeat of Augusta. But you know, once again, Maine's forces, because of their incredible training and their incredible esprit de corps uh they pull it off and they hold that key position until the the main allied force the main british force uh, advances and can steam through what was what was hitler's response to these these attacks because obviously you have the germans fighting on the russian front they feel that the italians can deal with this but what was hitler's response when it didn't seem to be going to the italians way so Hitler's response was um, unequivocal. I mean, he basically said he declared that Italy would not fall. And he sent um, Field Marshal Kesselring, who was one of his favoured generals, um, and actually a general who allied commanders didn't fear, but they respected his military acumen to a great deal. He sent Kesselring to oversee the battle, and they dispatched some of their finest units to the Italian front. This was, you know, this was all an all-out effort to make sure the Allied uh, attempt to take Italy would fail. And very quickly, the Allied advance started to grind into the sand because, uh, yes, of course, the Italians um, capitulated very quickly. You know, the armistice of Casabile was signed, uh, you know, very, very quickly. But that didn't mean that the resistance was over, far from it. The German, German troops simply moved into the Italian positions. The Italian fascists who remained loyal to the fascist regime or the fascist concept joined forces with them and the battle was back on. So very quickly that 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 lightning advance across Sicily and into southern Italy, you know, falls up against and starts to stumble upon German and German and Italian defences. You know, it's really interesting here in the, the German response to that and, and them wanting to support Italy and preventing it from falling. But I want to take a slight detour away from uh, fighting and military action now uh, and, and focus on some of the SAS culture. In your book, you really made singing seem like a major part of SAS life. What? Why is this? Because it was. I mean, you know, Maine was an Irishman. 
and he was always very clear about that. He was an Irishman, whether you know North or South didn't matter. He was he played for the Irish rugby team. He was an Irishman through and through. I mean, in in North Africa, you know, his jeeps of his patrol had shamrocks stenciled on them. He he was he had lots of Southern Irishmen in his command. His best friend that he joined up to the commandos with and then volunteered for the SAS with was Ewan McGonagall, who was um, you know Southern Irish Catholic. Okay, they'd met it university in northern ireland but but owen and 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 blair were the best of friends although they came from different sides of the sectarian divide that didn't matter to maine he was an irishman and as long as you were a fighting irishman then then you were welcome in his unit and the fighting irish bought song it's as simple as that they bought song with them and so song became a an incredibly um important and kind of embedding part of the esprit de corps of the unit was how they bonded as warriors and how they let their hair down was was song it's exactly like that that scene i described with the pianola in the streets of augusta they are there of course the pianola plays itself there's a there's a guy at the keyboard miming as if he's playing the rest of singing along and this is what Maine would always do you know whenever they had a moment where they could find grab some downtime their pilfer loot buy, borrow or steal whatever booze came to hand and they'd sit down and they'd party and essential to that partying was song. And it's interesting because there were two songs that, that Maine was accustomed to singing. One of them was Eileen, which was this kind of like lilting love ballad, basically. And if he started the evenings with a rendition of Eileen, people knew it was going to be an evening that was full of good cheer and fine spirits. But if he started the evening with Tread on the Tail of Me Coat, which is a more kind of martial, um, combative song, they knew that there might be hijinks and fisticuffs to follow. Because, you know, Maine, like many of the men in under his command, uh, drank too much. And when he drank too much, he could get out, out of control and do the most craziest things you can, you can ever imagine. I chronicle some of them in the book. But let's just backtrack a second and, and ask ourselves why. So I was a war reporter for 20 years before becoming an author. Uh, so I've been in lots of war-torn situations. And I know for a fact that the way we as war reporters dealt with that horrendous uh, stress and trauma of what we had seen was the bar. You would go back to the bar and you would drink yourself uh, stupid. And I remember, I remember a time when there was a a fellow war reporter who was a good friend of mine uh, called Carlos Mervolium, um, who uh, is, is sadly died um, uh, on the Afghan, um, sorry, the Pakistani Afghan border. Um, and I remember a time when he went into a bar and he saw all these reporters there and he took a grenade, rolled it across the floor of the bar and said, get out, you bastards, and report. Stop drinking at the bar. Now, the grenade wasn't primed it didn't explode but it made the point so crazy stuff happens in those situations i understand that um and um you know because it, i i i believe i'm convinced i know that for many of these individuals um in the ss in world war ii the trauma was cumulative it was a drip drip effect and so many of them were not just tortured after the war, but tortured during the war. So I had the first book, um, SS Brothers in Arms, and this one, SS Forged in Hell, read by uh, Ross Townsend, who's a top PTSD expert in the UK. And she said, look, one of these missions, you know, for weeks on end behind enemy lines, doing those kind of things, seeing your closest friends getting killed, you know, injured, captured, and having to do those terrible things to the enemy would give you trauma. Five years of repeated actions behind enemy lines, it's impossible that you would not end up absolutely tortured. So drinking and singing were the antidotes. Singing and drinking, drinking and singing. Whenever you could, you'd gather with your fellow raiders and you would drink and you would sing. And you'd gather with your fellow raiders because no one else could understand what you had been through. Because no one else had been there. No one else shared those experiences. No one else could understand. That's what it was about. Thank you for that. And thank you for relaying your personal experience in relation with that, because that was really, really powerful and helping us understand why these men were drinking and singing and what they were trying to, to deal with at that point. Now, when they're in Italy as well, they're tasked with some really quite difficult uh, objectives. And across that, there come some really quite harrowing battles. And after a period of drinking and singing, rest and recovery, they're tasked with seizing the the bridges that cross the Rufina River. 
Why was it important to seize these bridges? So they were going into um, to a, a coastal town in northeastern, so on the on the Adriatic coast of Italy. Um, it sits Tomoli sits just to the north of Rome, and the idea was that by seizing Tomoli by an amphibious landing, they would leapfrog around the German defensive line, uh, and so outflank you know German positions and force them to fall back. Classic military manoeuvre. Um, and the bridges over the Perferno River had to be seized and secured because that would allow Allied, the main Allied force to then you know, speed up the um, coastal roads and, and relieve them. So the concept was the SAS, together with, with commandos, uh, were to land by assault landing craft, these, these larger um, kind of troop ships, and take uh, Tomoli by surprise and then fan out, take the surrounding terrain, rid it of the enemy and seize the bridges. That was the raison d'etre of the mission. So you're now talking autumn 1943. And again, it's one of those missions where it's the, these are not these are not what the SAS trained for originally or was formed for. You know, these are not fast hit and run rains. These aren't shoot and scoot attacks. It's not hide in the hills, ambush a convoy of German trucks, jump in your jeeps and speed away. This is a mission to go in and seize a a, a town held by an elite German garrison and hold that town and the bridges and trains surrounding it for long enough for the main army to arrive. So it's a very different kind of war fighting for which they've trained for. And, you know, I'd always understood from, you know, veterans I'd spoken to, I'd always heard this term, Tomoli was hell. And most people you'd speak to would just never say any more than that. Just, you know, Timoni, Timoli was hell. I never really understood it until writing this book because, trust me, Timoli was hell. We've had a discussion before we started recording about Timoli and, and Timoli being an incredibly harrowing battle and, um, and, and how it affected these men. What, what happened at the Battle of Timoli for, for these men to describe it as, as hell? So the initial landing goes uh, as planned. Um, you know, the commandos take the town and the SAS fan out around, you know, to take the hills and the surrounding terrain and to take the bridges. Um, and it's all largely successful. Uh, one one SAS patrol led by this incredibly um, courageous and colourful figure called Captain John Tonkin is overrun uh, and, and he and his men are captured, but largely it's mission accomplished. And so... Maine sets up his headquarters in the in, in Tomoli town, and they're awaiting the Allied main army to advance. And they think it's it's all over by the shouting. And this is when the battle turns. So overnight, the weather turns atrocious, and the the pontoon bridges that have been thrown across the Perferno River uh, are swept away, or at least those that aren't swept away become unusable. It's just too dangerous. The river's swollen, um, and so the SS SAS and the commandos are cut off. At the same time, Hitler is apoplectic that the Allies have landed north of Rome. He's ordered Kesselring to retake Tomoli. The 16th Panzer Division has been retasked to do so. This is a battle-hardened armoured unit, and their orders are to take Tomoli at all cost and to throw the Allied invaders back into the sea. And against them you have a few hundred commandos, a few hundred SAS, and a similar number of regular troops, and the most heavy weapons that any of them have are a handful of field guns. It is a, it's a, it's it's a last stand at the Alamo situation, and um, the battle over the coming days becomes exactly that. It, and it is, it's so hard to describe the, you know, it's so hard to. It, I hope I managed to do it in the book, but how you know, you can stand against, you know, panzer tanks rolling down the main, the main railway line when you have, you know, at best a couple of scavenged field guns whose crews have all been killed. It is, it is just extraordinary, extraordinary courage and tenacity beyond all reckoning. And the glue that holds it together, certainly on the side of the SAS, is Paddy Main. He is just, um, he will not take a backward step. And he is there. You know, there's a scene on 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 what became known as Bren Gun Ridge. It became known as Bren Gun Ridge because it had a load of SAS and some commandos on the ridge facing the enemy, fighting off you know everything up to main battle tanks with Bren guns. That's what it amounted to. And Maine is up there, 
uh, he 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 was renowned for going into battle with a Bren-like machine gun, wielding it like a carbine from the shoulder, but also with a camera on the other shoulder. He was always taking photographs. And he was taking photographs because, one, he loved taking photographs. Two, he wanted to document the SAS at war. But most importantly, this was the most important reason, whenever they liberated another town, he'd go into the chemist, get the roll of photographs developed, and get loads of copies made and give them to his men. Because imagine the morale boost. Here you are, boys. This is you in action. You know, it was so he was going around Brain Gun Ridge, you know, under fire, you know, taking photographs of his men and 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 and, and boosting their morale and 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 fighting alongside them. And you know, it, so many times you 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 come across accounts of individuals in the battle for Tamoli who say he is what enabled them and inspired them to stand firm. It's a battle that even having having written the account that I have, I still can't understand how they endured. I do not understand it. I do not know how that they were victorious, how they held Tamoli. It's I'll give you an indication of how desperate it was. So <laughs> at one stage <laughs> they got the um so they're holding the railway station. And the main avenue advance that the Germans are using is down the railway line because obviously it's a good route of ingress, especially for armour. And so there's a locomotive parked up in the railway station. And of course, during SAS training, you are you were trained to drive trains because you could go and steal an enemy train and bring back all that war material, or you could or you could hijack an enemy train, drive it into a tunnel and blow it up and block a railway line. So they know how to drive a train. And so what they do is they get this train, they stack and they realize it's stacked full of explosives. Okay. It's obviously it was an enemy train, explosive train, and so they so they they rig it with charges, and their last ditch defence is going to be to steam that stri- that train up the railway line, and trigger the explosive and blow it up in the face of the enemy armour. I mean, yeah, it, it's Tamoli is an incredibly desperate battle, and what really makes it so very dark is that at one stage they're mustering the last of their reinforcements to bring all of the SAS up to the front line positions. And so there's a column of trucks outside the monastery where they're billeted. And as they get into the column of trucks, the enemy, and I think it's just a fluke, they unleash um, a volley of shells and one of them lands in uh, one of the trucks. And there are, it's just carnage, absolute bloody carnage. It's the single greatest loss of life the SAS suffered in World War II from one incident. And it's really, really horrific and so i and even after that which is you know at that moment you know they could have faltered because they've lost so many and there are so many wounded and it it's so bloody and horrendous but the defense continues regardless and then you know there's another moment not so long thereafter where one of the you know most popular commanders of you know under main one of his most popular de- deputies um you know they're they're manning a field gun which they've scavenged from the dead gunners, the Royal, Royal Artillery gunners, because they've all been killed and overrun, and they have it sighted at a haystack. Uh, that's their cover, and the enemy caught score a direct hit on the haystack, and it's burning. Well, he ca- the commander carries on operating that field gun as do his men until the burning haystack falls on top of them, and they are burned alive. And there's one individual who dashes in and out of that burning haystack time and time again, saving his 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 comrades until he actually falls and is burned alive and stuff. I mean, just, just, just horrendous. And, um, you know, the fact that they endure and they beat off the 16th Panzer Division is, is yeah, it just, yeah, words fail me. I, I, I felt exactly the same reading those, those pages and those chapters because it is just so harrowing and but you still have that light of of paddy main being such an inspiring figure and, and these men protecting each other and you know with this loss and and the nature of some of these deaths uh because you know i, I will leave it to people to read the book to, to to learn about that but how do these men how does it affect these men after this battle do you know term early was um really tough um you know some of the guys didn't recover and I don't mean they didn't recover physically. Of course, there were some who were injured who didn't recover physically, but some of them didn't recover mentally, you know, in terms of what we now recognise as post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and so there's one individual who, um, and it's not told in the book because it, it, it happens after the book comes to an end, but he he s- 
supposed to deploy into France um, on on post D-Day operations, and he goes to his commander and says, "Look, I can't go. You know, um, my nerves gone." That's what they termed it at the time, and he's he's persuaded to deploy, and he deploys into France, and uh, almost immediately he ends up in a French hospital, having um, basically cracked up. So Timoni cast a very long shadow, um, and you're absolutely right in what you said just a, a, a few you know minutes earlier. What holds them together throughout that battle, that epic battle, is the Brotherhood. There's nothing else. It's not their weaponry. It's not their, you know, the backup or the fact they know they've got reinforcements coming. They know nothing. As far as they're concerned, that bridge, those bridges over the Buferno are no more. No one's coming for them. This is their last stand. And it's the Brotherhood that holds them together. There's this one amazing scene which kind of, I think, demonstrates it most powerfully. So this guy called Joe, uh, Joe Goldsmith, um, who was nicknamed Buttercup Joe because he had a very rural accent. And there's a song that was a very popular English folk song, which is a kind of Mickey taking song about a, a rural guy called Buttercup Joe. And Buttercup Joe, his real name's not even Joe. And obviously his surname's Goldsmith, but everybody knew him as Buttercup Joe. No one knew his real name. And he actually took on the mantle of that. And he would sing that song, Buttercup Joe's song, during these sing-song evenings they had together. Anyway, at the height of the battle, um, Joe Goldsmith has been um, triaging and treating the wounded from the shelling attack that I described and he rejoins Maine on the front line and it's the morning of the of the of this of the kind of final horrendous battle at Brain Gun Ridge and he says to you know Paddy Maine where do you need me he says go down to the railway line because Major Roy Farron is there with a few men so Major Roy Farron from two SAS because obviously Maine's unit is one SAS has arrived in the nick of time overland driving jeeps they fought their way through and some more of two SAS actually arrived by sea, uh, sailing these kikes, which are you know traditional um, sailing craft used in the area. So there's a few reinforcements that have arrived. Main says, go down to the railway line and try and give covering fire to Farron's men, because that's where they're going to come. So, so Joe Goldsmith goes down there, looks around, thinks I need a vantage point. The only, the only point he can spy is a massive 500-gallon petrol um, drum you know, one of these storage uh, drums. And he thinks, well, I'll climb on top of that. So he climbs on top of the petrol drum with his Bren gun and spends the day up there raining down fire on the enemy and obviously taking lots of incoming fire, knowing that if one of those rounds hits the petrol tank, he's going to be incinerated alive. That was the spirit that saved the day. And and Paddy Main wrote Joe Goldsmith up for a military cross for that operation, for that part, you know, his role in the operation there. And, and you know, he duly received it. But that that kind of heroism in the battle for Tremoli is repeated time after time after time. And every single time that it's evidenced, it's because, you know, it's it, it's the need to stand firm and stand with your brothers in arms. And that's the esprit de corps. And that's the most essential thing to understand um, about, you know, this unit at this time. It had this spirit and this esprit de corps that was second to none. And you, you find that again and again and again, echoed in the accounts of those who were there. It was it was so inspiring reading about those moments of brotherhood to protect one another uh, throughout those chapters and throughout your book. But but now I want to move to a slightly lighter tone with our final fun question, as we do for all the guests here on the podcast. Is you know you've throughout your career you've visited many countries, investigated many different stories, which has had the biggest effect on you? On me personally, um, golly, that's a really interesting question. Um, I've, I mean, I've so many stories that I've told. Um, I think writing, I, I'm going to answer it in a slightly different way. I think I have a love of writing these kind of stories from World War II because it's a war in which we were fighting it for all the right reasons. But not only that, those who stepped forward to fight were everybody. It was every man from all walks of life, you know. So many of those in, in featured in, in Forged in Hell or, or any of these books, they weren't career soldiers. They had no military training before the war. They were butchers or they were artists or they were poets or they were, you know, they were safe breakers or they were farmers or miners from Wigan. They came from all walks of life, from all social stratas, and they were united in one cause, the need to defeat Nazism. So 
those kind of stories are you know really rare to come across and i think that in this day and age where we see the lessons that we should have learned from the first world war, sorry second world war not being learned and we see conflicts erupting as we are right now um where people should be trying to forge peace uh you know these lessons need to be learned and they need to be learned fast because we are we're living in a troubled world and that kind of inspiration and that kind of example is something that we should put before us now today in terms of how we approach the challenges that you know that that we as a as a race face so i think as a human race face so i think that's what i get from writing these kind of stories that inspiration and that reminder of the fact that he who doesn't learn the lesson from history is doomed to repeat it i think that's a really nice and and powerful uh, message there because uh, I, cer- I, I, I certainly agree with everything that you've just said there so thank you very much for that Damien I really appreciate that now obviously people uh, have heard heard you discuss your book for an hour they're going to want to go and grab a copy of your books uh, particularly Forged and How so where can they grab a copy but also where can they interact with you um, so I am um, I've got lots of events coming up so I just Spoken at the Dorchester Literary Festival. I'm speaking at the Yeovil Literary Festival, the Taunton Literary Festival, Hungerford Literary Festival, Stratford upon Avon, Bath Theatre Royal, the Imperial War Museum, the Natural Army Museum, and more. So uh, details of all of those are available on my website or my Twitter feed, which is Author D Lewis, or on Facebook, which is my uh, Damien Lewis writer. Um, so yeah, you know, go to any of those kind of social media feeds and you'll find all the things I'm up to. And I will be speaking about essays forged in hell a lot over the next two or three months because, you know, books out next week. And um, this is the time to really get the message out there. Uh, where can you buy it? All good bookshops, um, all supermarkets, Amazon, obviously, all online shops. Yeah. And uh, Cole's Books in Bista are doing um, signed and dedicated copies. So if you go onto Coles Books' website, you can order your own a copy, get your own personal dedication. I'll be there in a few weeks' time. I'll do all those personal dedications, and they'll be shipped out to you in time for Christmas. So they do a great service. Awesome. And I'll make sure all those links are in the description below for people to see where they can come and see you talk about it, but also grab their own personal signed copy. Well, thank you very much for coming on, Damien. I really appreciate it. No, that's great. Always good to be uh, on the show. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for listening to this brand new episode of the History of Jackson podcast that we had Damien Lewis on discussing his new book, SAS, Forged in Hell, From Desert Rats to Dogs of War, The Mavericks Who Made the SAS. That was an awesome interview and I'm sure that you guys enjoyed it and I'm sure that you guys want to grab a copy of Damien's new book. Now, if you guys did enjoy it, please do consider heading to History of Jackson Plus on Apple Podcasts or History of Jackson uh, Buy Me a Coffee profile page in the description below. Those descriptions will be in the description alongside all those descriptions that I just mentioned and Damien just mentioned as well. So we also have another awesome episode lined up for next Sunday and I'm hoping that you guys are looking forward to it as well.